All right. Welcome everyone to this uh, last webinar of our series on on webinars for connecting to dot symposium. Today we are talking about uh, smart network and and everything related to it, and we are accompanied by a host of uh, lovely Estonian experts on the topic. Just a quick uh, uh, reminder that uh, this whole webinar will be recorded and uh, uh, the recording will be made available online. The easiest way to find it is to go on YouTube and and search for Youth Partnership and there you will find a YouTube channel for the partnership. And the three previous webinars all, are already online there. Uh, before we go into the topic, I will just quickly tell you also that Coyote magazine is uh, coming up on their issue this week about smart youth work. So make sure to also uh, take this one into account. Um, that's all for me. And I will give now the stage to our lovely Estonian experts. So uh, without further ado, I give you the stage. Hello. Hi, I hope you can all uh, hear me here in our uh, webinar that we're having today. My name is Louis Zezeran, and I'm going to lead you through the next hour. We've got some very interesting uh, topics around smart youth work, and uh, we're here to describe the smart youth work initiative that's been uh, presented by the Estonian Youth Work Centre in collaboration with the Estonian Ministry of Education and Research. And as we were talking about before, all of this is leading up to our symposium later in the month called Connecting the Dots, Young People, Social Inclusion and Digitalization that's happening later in the month and it's gonna be great. Now, the way that we're doing this hour today is that we're gonna start with a bit of a general talk about digitalization and AI, how can that affect young people, what's happening there, and then we're going to start to look at the three focus areas that the Obvi Smart Youth Work Initiative, which is mainly how we access young people and how can young people access to services and how are they using it. On the other side, how are youth workers getting training and education to be able to use these tools. And the third focus area is producing systems so that uh, youth workers can gather the data and have the collaboration solutions to be able to do their job, their smart youth work correctly. Now, there are three focuses for the smart youth work initiative. And at the end of the hour, we're going to be talking about a, a very, very important topic that covers all three, which is mental health. So we're going to be taking a broader look at that uh, near the end of the hour. And we're also going to have some questions. So if you have those questions, you can write them into the chat box there. We're going to see them and we're going to be able to talk about them at end. Now, the first talk that we have is a gentleman by the name of Thomas Mamma. And Thomas comes from Model VR, and there he's an expert in digitalization, uh, the future of AI, the future of technology. And he's going to talk to us a little bit, and we're going to have a bit of a discussion about where is technology going and what could this possibly mean for youth workers. So, uh, Thomas, uh, if you're there, my friend, we're going to switch over to you right now. Where's old Thomas? Here we go. Thomas is looking good. I can't hear what Thomas says. Okay. That... Let's oh. let's try again. Oh beautiful. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Awesome. So everybody can hear me? That's good. Um so yes, my name is Thomas Mema. Uh, I recently finished my master thesis with the um, topic of religion and AI. So hence, I've been considered as inspirational speaker for this um, webinar. And uh, yes, I want to tell you uh, what I learned during my uh, writing my master thesis and uh, looking into the topic of AI future and the current state. Uh, I would I would keep it really general, and if, if you have any um, more specific questions, then please uh, let me know. Uh, currently, humans are considered uh, 
uh, rulers of the world. And this is mainly thanks to our intelligence. And we can consider us the smartest. Uh, and this gives us uh, ability to um, apply our rules to everybody else. But uh, current uh, developments in AI on artificial intelligence uh, predict that uh, soon there will be something else that is smarter than us. And hence, this something smarter than then can apply their rules on us. Um, let me just show you one graph here. Um, can you see? Let me check. Yes. Um, so we can see here two graphs. On the left side, you can see how industrial revolution made a revolution in our capability to grow economic growth. And it was exponential growth. From 19th century, uh, the line growth line that was horizontal suddenly turned into vertical. And it's basically thanks to the fact that we uh, changed from human labor into machine labor. And now we can say, see um, similar expectation can be applied to artificial intelligence when we uh, change from human thinking into machine thinking. So let me go back there. Um, yep, so we can see that, uh, oh, let me just turn back. So we can see that uh, if uh, on 1950, when artificial intelligence was started and its intelligence was pretty much zero, then uh, current predictions by experts is that we can achieve human level machine intelligence by 2050. And, uh, average human intelligence is uh, IQ of 100. And if we consider growth of 10 times per 50 years, we can expect that by 2200, uh, artificial intelligence can have IQ of 100,000. So this is um, obviously it's a speculation, but it would just uh, give you some perspective what we can expect for, from artificial intelligence if it would really get as smart as humans or, or smarter. And uh, before I go any further, I will uh, try to define artificial intelligence a little bit. Um, artificial intelligence is um, obviously it consists from two words. Uh, from artificial that's man-made and intelligence is ability to achieve complex tasks. And uh, currently machines are or artificial intelligence is pretty good at uh, achieving complex tasks on some narrow domains, like let's say playing chess. Um, and if we compare it to if humans, humans are really good at uh, achieving different goals. Like if we take a human child, then giving enough time and training, human child can pretty much achieve anything. It can can learn any language or or become good at some sports or science. So we can see that currently humans are winning in breath, but uh, uh, machines are much better at some specific narrow domain. And uh, hence current uh, goal in artificial intelligence is to gain artificial general intelligence. That means capability of um, artificial intelligence to learn anything, to be self-learning on a wide array of uh, things. And if we go to future predictions, then um, basically there are three options. There is either everything is going to be really rosy, it's going to be rainbows and butterflies. Uh, middle option is that it's going to be pretty much status quo, that we will be working with uh, AI, but nothing generally changes much. And the third option is, is dystopia. That's uh, pretty much the frightening future when robots take over and kill us kill us all like we've seen in in certain movies like terminator or the matrix and humanity's enslaved uh, but already currently we can see how um, artificial intelligence is is 
becoming ubiquitous, it's it's pretty much just everywhere. If you use your phone, for example, use Google Translate, it's AI. There are self-driving cars and so forth. So um, also we can we already giving a lot of authority to artificial intelligence in the sense if we have any questions, then we feel normal to ask first from Google. And we have given this authority of knowledge to artificial intelligence in a sense already. Uh, so we can see that if uh, artificial intelligence gets smarter, then it can have unexpected consequences. It can have different opinions than us. It can have different goals and hence it can give us that not necessarily are in our benefit. And uh, uh, therefore, we have to really think how we how we uh, develop the artificial intelligence so that its uh, interests will be aligned with ours in the future. So what you're saying, Thomas, is we need to develop an AI that doesn't have a bad attitude. Pretty much, uh, we can we can uh, look at this way that we are parents and AI is our child. So if we want that our children or our child will be will become a decent person, like friendly and, and take good care of its parents in the later in life and parents are not so healthy anymore, for example, or not so smart anymore. Then we want this child to have this attitude that, okay, it will respect its, its elderly parents, for example. <laughs> and, uh, and it will, even if uh, it doesn't necessarily have the same, um, same wishes as us, as we do, it at least it won't be hostile towards us. That we would hope that yes. It's very interesting to think that we're. It's only, it, it literally sounds like we're creating a child. It sounds like it sounds like a lot of work. I don't want to raise a kid now. I've got to raise an AI. Wow, it sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, and uh, in in a way, it's it's. It, we never know what our children will become. And in the current case, as you can see here, it's, it's, it could be really good, it could be really bad. And um, one way to think of it if, is that even if it's very bad, then it's still our children. And uh, if they become smarter than us, then isn't it still worth doing it? Like, uh, we have to choose are we are we more important than something that we create or or would it be worthy sacrifice if we if we die but we manage to create something bigger than us something better than us that can give start to something totally different even if the humankind in in the process could vanish like it could go really um, oh, so it's not so great. inspirational in that way. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Thomas, I think we need to we need to end it there. Unfortunately, my friend, uh, we do need to, to move on with the hour. So thank you very much uh, for your input and uh, for letting us understand where we're, we're going with this. Thank you. All good. All right, we've cut off Thomas's feet. We're out. This is the Oscars. If you go over time, we're going to start playing the orchestra. <laughs> Uh, it's me playing a violin. That's the only orchestra we have here. Now, what we would like to do to start to introduce our uh, Smart Youth Work uh, initiative, we're going to play you a short video which gives you an overview of this. Smart Youth Work. The youth field must go hand in hand with social and technological change. This means that youth work must meet the needs young people identify themselves and provide... <coughs> them with access to a range of new, versatile and attractive activities. Let's look now. What is Smart Youth Work and what goals have been set in the Smart Youth Work concept? How did Smart Youth Work develop? Estonians came up with the idea of Smart Solutions in 2013. When framing the development plan for the youth field for 2014 through to 2020. The Estonian government approved the Youth Field Development Plan for 2014-2020 at its cabinet meeting on the 6th of December 2013, with one of the aims being to develop a smart youth work concept, which was released 
in 2016. At the same time, the idea of addressing the challenges and opportunities of the digital era for youth work was also circulating around at the EU level. On the 15th of December 2015, the Council and the representatives of the governments of the member states meeting within the Council adopted the European Union Work Plan for Youth for 2016-2018 with the intention of taking youth work into the digital age. In 2016, the European Commission set up an expert group with the intended outcome of delivering digital youth work and increasing youth workers' digital skills among the targets to be achieved. In the second half, of 2017, during the Estonian presidency of the European Union, smart youth work became one of the priority topics. During the Estonian presidency, the conclusions of smart youth work were adopted which among other things called the member states and the European Commission to create conditions for smart youth work. Why is smart youth work needed? There are no significant constraints framing young people's internet and ICT use in Estonia. Most of their daily activities take place on the internet and social media acts as their main communication channel. The youth field needs to respond to the needs of young people as well as to this change in society. It is important that smart device use and young people's presence in the virtual world are not seen as a problem, but an opportunity. Youth work can provide young people with both competing activities and developing solutions in a technological setting. What is smart youth work? Smart youth work stands for innovative development of youth work, which involves developing and using smart solutions in youth work, but also includes components of research, quality and policy making. Smart youth work is not a practice that represents a type of youth work, nor does it replace any existing practices. Our ambitions are that smartness is an underlying principle of youth work in Estonia. Youth workers are trained sufficiently and extensively on how to find a safe and secure role for digital content and tools in their work. Local governments are open to new ways of organizing youth work based on young people's views on how to best provide it. And they make it possible to develop or use creative solutions to engage young people, including any solutions to increase youth participation. For example, we have composed the Smart Youth Work Toolbox in Estonia where good practices and opportunities have been collected to enhance smartness in work with youth. What is smart youth work? Smart solutions for young people, digital competencies and digital working methods of youth workers, developing quality youth work opportunities through digital solutions. Smart youth work enables planning, creating, and implementing innovative activities for young people, as well as offering new opportunities for them to be active and develop into adults in a balanced and modern way. Smartly, virtually, globally. To the clouds. Okay, uh, now that was a uh, handsome and rather familiar voice in that uh, little clip that we had there. Sorry about the choppiness of the video. Don't forget, you can watch this again online. We're going to have the whole thing recorded. We're going to have links. Don't worry about nothing. Everything is going to be fine. Now, we're going to start off, uh, we're going to look at the three focus areas that we spoke about in the video. And the first one is smart solutions for young people. So that is, it is an element of making sure that they can access the information and systems online that they need. Uh, it, it's also about having, uh, using technology to help train them. So how can 
this technology, give them better skills to get out there in the workplace and, and make a contribution. But it's important to understand it's not just about online service. It's about the whole picture that we're helping young people with. And to talk to us more about this, I'd like to invite now Rain Zobel. And uh, Rain is from Model VR. Pardon me, uh, Mr. Mamer is not from that before. I said that incorrectly. So we're going to switch over to Rain Zobel right now. Hope you're around. We're going to do the little transfer. And uh, there we go. We're making it happen. Hi, Rain. All right, we're working on your audio. We can't hear your audio yet, but we're making that happen. You can just nod and smile, look good, stroke that beard. Okay, maybe your side is muted, uh, Ryan. Oh, it was my bad, I'm sorry. Oh! <laughs> okay, you take it away, Ryan. You've got it, go for it. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Ryan Sobel. I'm uh, uh, ex-film director, now virtual content director. So I represent a company called Model VR Productions. And uh, last year we made uh, two VR productions uh, for Estonian uh, Youth Centre. Uh, so these two experiences that we made, uh, one was made to promote the profession of bioanalytics and the other one was uh, for nurses. I'm going to make that full screen. Okay, I think that's better. So uh, we made these two experiences. They consisted of 360 degrees video, 2D video and uh, interactivity. And uh, then our sort of partner company called Civita Estonia uh, has been making these workshops uh, where they bring with them uh, 15 sets of uh, virtual reality headsets so the young people put them on top of their heads uh, they watch this uh, story that we have created uh, which uh, gives them pretty much puts them in the shoes of uh, of a nurse or a bioanalytic and after watching that they have a practical workshop where, where they can um, test different kind of things like um, observe tumors through microscopes and stuff like this. Uh, so our company created this uh, content for them. Uh, it was uh, pretty hard to do because it's sort of a mix of uh, actors uh, and real world uh, professionals. Um, but but um, the feedback so far has been really positive. Uh, it has been shown to 617 participants. As I understand, uh, these are mostly young people with a risky background. Uh, so they often don't get to experience um, the opportunities uh, out there regarding uh, career choices. So this gives them a very uh, very personal uh, and very, you know, close um, contact with uh, with the everyday work that people do in laboratories, uh, in the ambulances, in ER rooms where they can't be physically. So uh, we think it's a very good use of uh, virtual reality. Um, also, virtual reality is a very new and immersive medium. So the feedback has been very positive because they get to experience uh, something new technologically, but at the same time, uh, this makes them more receptive uh, towards uh, content uh, that we actually want to show them, which is to introduce the professions and career opportunities. And there has also been interest from the Estonian Unemployment Insurance Fund because uh, there, is, there is always a need for more nurses uh, so uh, they have shown interest to show this to, in in their events also uh, to to use it to educate uh, and uh, make people more interested in in becoming a nurse. Uh, and of course, uh, since since the nature of the workshops is very hands-on, uh, then this uh, is definitely uh, creating more effect on people than just 
than just uh, sitting in a lecture hall and uh, watching a presentation or uh, watching a video, a normal 2D video from the screen. So I think that's about it for me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Zarain. We've switched it back on there, very good. Now, if you are watching the webinar and you have some questions about anything that we're going over today, uh, do write it into the chat box and we're gonna have a few moments at the end to be able to answer some of those questions that you have. Now, the entire Estonian Smart Youth Work Initiative is uh, summarized in this great book that uh, the department has, has put out, the Youth Work Center has put out. We can see it there. It's looking great. It's got everything in there. There's words, there's pictures. It's an amazing book. And uh, it's all summarized there. Now we are going to move on to focus area number two, which is looking at youth workers. So uh, it is the other side of the coin. As you know, with youth work, we need to educate youth workers. We need to give them the skills and the tools that they need to be able to work and implement all of these smart solutions. So to tell us more about this, I would now like to invite our next presenter, uh, Martin Johnson. Martin, we're going to switch over to you right now, make that happen. So just a second. She's coming online. And there we go. Got the presentation. Hello, Martin. Hi. Hi. Good Hi. to see you. Good well, to see I you try to, I I'll try to keep uh, keep on time and I hope you're not going to play the violin uh, before I finish. Um, so um, I would like to give a critical look at the development needs of the youth workers when implementing smart youth work and I'm a trainer myself so to start off I would like you to to come with me into a smart youth work training and just imagine you're there. So it's it's the first day of the training. Um, the participants are gathering. They are taking out their computers, their um, tablets, smartphones, getting everything connected to a Wi-Fi, and we are ready to start the training. Well, me and my colleague will introduce ourselves and we'll tell a little bit about what is the smart youth work concept, what do we mean by that, and then it's it's also important to mention that within this training. We are doing everything there, hands-on. We'll try out a bunch of apps, new ones and old ones, but the main thing is that we want to test them and try them out. We're not just going to talk about it. And then it's time to give the floor to the participants. And we ask them to share with us some of their experiences with smart youth work and some of the challenges that they might be facing. And we hear a lot of a lot of examples, well, mostly how Facebook is being used in youth centers, how uh, people are communicating over to Facebook. But then also we hear very concrete questions. For example, what sort of application should I use if I want to make a video that I can share with the, the youth? And all that, then we get to a, a participant who says, first of all, I don't like technology. I really hate it. And in fact, when it comes to smart youth work, I think it's a terrible idea because what we should do is to get people away from the screens. And within this training, I don't want to create a single user account, no accounts, no passwords. So this was an example that we come across pretty much every time we start a new training on smart youth work, there's always someone who's really doubting on the ideas of smart youth work or who's really, well, simply said, against technology. What we call it is it's a digital divide. And two years ago, a study was done in Estonia that was looking at youth workers and the way they use technology in their work. And from that study, we can see that 44% of youth workers are using digital solutions in, in their everyday work. And then also what we can see there is that there are regional differences, which means that the youth workers who are working in the cities tend to be using more technology than people working in the rural areas. So we have clearly a divide over there. But there's more to it. 
Um, and when we're looking at youth workers, we can see that there are conservative youth workers who are more or less the people like I described you in my example. They're people who think that technology is not really there for any good. It's mostly problems and we need to get young people away from swiping their screens. And then there's also innovative youth workers, people who are really looking for ways how to engage technology into their everyday work, whether it's starting off with Facebook, going further into using numerous different applications. And then we have youth workers who are at the beginning of their careers. We can say that they are digital natives, but they are very new to the area of work, so they're not quite sure yet what to incorporate in their work and what not. But what we can see from this research as well is that it's clearly what youth workers are stating is that there's need for trainings, counseling and support. And trainings and counseling is also needed for the people who are innovative already. They have already started to use something, but they are not yet sure how to go further with it. What else can we do? So therefore, the trainings would come into play. And in Estonia, we've been running a number of workshops and trainings for youth workers. And within those trainings, we'd like to be really practical and hands-on. And the tools that we've been uh, teaching or sharing and learning in those trainings, they follow three different areas. First of all, the tools for engaging and, and reaching out to youth. Because I mentioned Facebook, but let's be honest, young people are not in Facebook anymore. In fact, the number of users on Facebook is dropping, especially when we are looking at youngsters. So we need to look for somewhere else. And perhaps Snapchat is not your first option, but well, this is where the youngsters are and maybe it's, it's a good time to start testing it. Then there's tools for collaboration with the young people, but also for collaboration with your colleagues. And for that, Slack and Padlet have proved to be really good tools. And also different applications for uh, improving efficiency in the youth centers. Um, and Trello has, has been really amazing for when you, when you need to run a project together with a team. But another picture that comes across in those trainings way too often is what you're seeing on your screen. One thing is an empty battery that can be fixed. But unfortunately, when youth workers are coming to the trainings, we ask them to bring their own devices so that they are feeling more comfortable with it. But those devices often are not really up to date. And when we ask people to download application, we hear way too often that they can't because the device isn't letting them or the memory is full. So this is a place that definitely need, needs improvement, that youth centers cannot be the places where we dump our old technology. It needs to be a place with the newest technology possible. But one thing is the technology or the hardware that we have in our hands. But I think most importantly, at least what we've seen in our trainings, is the mindset. The way you look at the technology and the, the new technology that's out there, do you see it as a possibility? Do you see it only as a problem? Or you can have a balanced look at it. And this is what we've been trying to create in our trainings is that the youth workers can see the positive, the possibilities of different applications and tools to be able to use in smart youth work, but also are well aware of the downsides of it. So thank you. Here we go. Thank you very much, Marlene. Uh, a very, very interesting talk and raising some, I, I believe these issues, we, we can see them, we understand this, and uh, definitely stuff that needs to be addressed. So thank you, thank you very much. Now we are going to move along to our focus area number three right now of the Smart Youth Work Initiative. And focus area number three has the full and official title of Developing Quality Youth Work through digital solutions, meaning we need the infrastructures in place to give the correct tools to our youth workers to do the correct job. 
and uh, we can we because the the youth work field is uh, typically something that has low regulation from government and standardization, and that's because each youth work solution is very customized for a region, even down to the particularly young person. Now that uh, actually gives a lot of power to youth workers to really customize and come up with great solutions for young people, but also gives them a lot of responsibility as well. So one of the things that we may need is, is systems that collect a lot of data about youth, about young people that youth workers can access. We need great collaborative solutions like Mariam was just talking about before. And we also need great nationwide top-down strategic guidance from regulatory and government side so the youth workers understand the bounds which they're working inside of. So it's a very, very interesting area and that's why it's a whole focus for us, focus number three. And to talk to us more about this, I would like to introduce Madhavis Paliustik, pardon me for the pronunciations, I am a meager Australian. And uh, from the Barcelona Youth Center, and uh, Meredith is going to be talking to us more about these digital solutions. Take it away now. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you about um, one project what we are right now developing uh, in. Uh, so uh, and I'm giving you a little uh, background uh, about. Uh, uh, our uh, organization. So, Vasselina, I'm working in Vasselina and I'm head of uh, Vasselina Youth, Cent uh, Youth Center. So, Vasselina is a small base in uh, southeast of Estonia, region in region lives, uh, I guess, uh, 2000 people, and we have youngsters from 7 to 26, uh, uh, almost like uh, 400 uh, youngsters. And uh, we have a quite big uh, youth center uh, if uh, we think about Estonia. So we have a youth center where is a uh, thousand uh, square meters and we have a gym, we have skate park uh, and uh, every day there is uh, 60 youngsters uh, visiting uh, us. And in Estonia we have, uh, uh, we have able to uh, collect or apply money uh, to develop uh, open youth uh, work and uh, then we write some project uh, what is uh, about this digital uh, tool. So what was our needs? Our needs uh, was that uh, we don't have, um, uh, our youth, they don't have enough good uh, uh, youth information. So um, uh, mm, they don't have, we have like different kind of websites and uh, like uh, social media uh, so, uh, pages uh, where we, we share information, but uh, we don't have uh, like uh, one place where uh, share the information and uh, then uh, sometimes in uh, our village uh, things are happening unexpected unexpected things for example uh, some uh, hobby activity trainers uh, or uh, teachers they are sick and uh, today is uh, no uh, like uh, hobby activity uh, so you need to let them know youngsters that uh, today there is no hobby activity or the buses are going uh, earlier today or something else and uh, since um, in our youth center there is like gym and uh, inner skate park and in the region there is no uh, skate park and uh, gym then lots of uh, people are using and it's full all the time so youngsters they need uh, information about uh, uh, when is the best time to go uh, the second need was uh, where are our youngsters because uh, in uh, Asselina we have like 40 different activities uh, what youngsters can do uh, but uh, actually we don't we don't get like really good statistics every organization has their own uh, information and statistics about uh, their youngsters but uh, we don't have like a, a information in one place so this was the problem and uh, then the last problem uh, was uh, for parents that uh, they are uh, all the time uh, calling to youth center and, and asking that uh, where is my youngster so uh, is uh, my uh, son or daughter in the youth center so we wanted to solve this problem too so and then we thought that uh, we have to work out some kind of uh, uh, re registration system and then we thought that in Estonia we have already one uh, so as uh, association of Estonian 
Open Youth Center uh, has their own uh, notebook where you can uh, register youngsters in uh, uh, when they come to a youth center or if they come to an event. But uh, this uh, notebook is uh, developed in 2013 and it's, uh, it's developed for all the youth centers. So different youth centers, they are totally different and it's hard to uh, make one tool for everyone. So we thought that uh, we want to make our own tool. So what we are making then? So uh, we, we have like uh, four, five different biggest uh, organizations like uh, musical school, culture house, uh, sport club, youth center and school. So we put uh, every organization one uh, uh, touchscreen uh, registration screen. So uh, when youngsters are coming to hobby activator, uh, they are coming to youth center, then they have RFID card and then they can go to the screen and uh, they can uh, register the, themselves. And uh, on the screen, there is that virtual buttons where what you can uh, uh, push. So there is gym, for example, for uh, our uh, youth center, there is there are going to be gym, skate park, kids room, handicraft or some other hobby activity, hanging and chilling and or uh, for example, some event, some event, so it's going to be really easy to register yourself. And uh, when somebody wants to see like open uh, statistics, uh, for example, how many uh, youngsters are in gym or in skate park, then uh, you can uh, view uh, uh, the open statistics. And uh, then, then we're going to have uh, two smart screens in uh, school and uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, youth center. And on those screens, we have uh, coming events, uh, unexpected and important things. Uh, so when, for example, when uh, hobby activity starts today from uh, the, when they start uh, earlier or they start some, some another place, then uh, you can see this information. Uh, then we wanted to add the past times, uh, hobby activities timetable, so you can see all the time uh, when the activities are and you can push the buttons and uh, the right screen is opening. And uh, then the last thing, what, what is related with all this one is the smartphone app. So in the smartphone app uh, gives you the same information that uh, the smart screen is giving you. But uh, uh, beside that, you, can, you have a chance to register yourself to the youth center or, uh, or hobby activity. Uh, when something is changing and you are in uh, some hobby activity, then you get uh, specific information. For example, if when you are going to the skiing or skateboard uh, hobby activity, then and today there is no hobby activity, then you, you get push up uh, notice that today there is nothing. And, uh, and uh, we, then we thought that uh, we, we can share the information uh, with the parent when he, he or she wants to see, see where is the youngster, then uh, when the youngster is in the youth center, then uh, you can uh, you can see that he or she is in the youth center. And when he's in a hobby activity, then you can see that he, he or she is in a hobby activity. So this is the system what we are want we want to develop. And uh, what is the goals or outcomes we want, want to get with this uh, project is the better statistics about uh, youth behavior. So then it's easier for us to plan events and uh, hobby activities or even say municipality that we need some extra past times uh, because youngsters they can't get home then we want uh, that youngsters get uh, relevant uh, information and uh, fast information then uh, we want that parents know where their children are and uh, and our visitors youngsters or even adults can uh, uh, plan better their visit so this system is uh, just beginning and we are making like technical uh, capability to develop the uh, system. So this year we want to uh, want to have uh, the technical things and uh, next year uh, we are we want to do more. Uh, we want to develop more things. So this is just the beginning. And uh, yeah, so this is it. This is our system what we are uh, developing right now.
Hey, sorry about that, man. <laughs> sorry about that. Pardon me. Just dealing. I, I clicked on the mouse there too quick. Pardon me. Thank you very much for your talk. Very, very interesting to hear about what's happening in South, South Estonia uh, right from the front line. So thank you and uh, have a good day. Now into our chat, we pasted a link where you could download the PDF of uh, the overview of our Smart Youth Work Initiative. And uh, so you can get that PDF in there. Uh, we will be able to, if you can't open it, we're gonna help you with that in a moment. Uh, because also what the booklet does is give us some very definite terms of an activity plan. So the Smart Youth Work is not just some high level ideas. It's not just some general, oh, we think this is a great idea. Oh, let's do something like that. They've listed real uh, steps and actions that we will be taking to implement these ideas. And that I think is extremely, extremely important. Now, they're the three focus areas that we have with the Smart Youth Work Initiative. We're like, what are, how are young people accessing our systems? How are they using that technology? How are we training youth workers to be able to use that technology and learn how to do their job in this environment? And as we just heard there, how are we working on systems to support both sides of that, both the youth and the youth workers. All those three come together for our three focus groups. Now, at the end of our talk, we also wanted to touch on a very, very important area that goes across all three of our focus areas, and that namely is mental health. And that's something that we need to be wary of in all of the things that we do, uh, because this is certainly something that can be very common uh, with the young people that we're reaching out to. So to help us understand more about this, uh, we're gonna welcome in now Martha Rattus. And Martha is a mental health activist and a founding member of the Estonian Youth Movement of Mental Health. To talk to us for a moment a little bit about this. Martha, let's switch over to you right now. Do the mouse, do the buttons. Here we go, we're making the connection. Beautiful, we can see oh, you. Hello. Now we can hear you, lovely. You can see me as well? Oh, we can see hello. You. You, everything is good. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Martha. I am the vice chairman of external affairs of the Estonian youth movement of mental health. And I'm here to talk a little bit about our organization and uh, some of the practices we use. So our organization began in uh, August 2015 when a youth mental health website, PAIC, held a workshop to find new solutions to support young people and their mental health. And at this workshop, the idea to create an organization was born. Uh, for two years, we existed under the same NGO, but uh, since late uh 2017 we have been an independent organization so who are we we are young people from the ages 15 up to 30 with some supporting members who are over 30 years old as well but our target group is under 30. Uh, most of our members have experienced some sort of mental health problems but it is not a requirement to join we welcome everybody who are motivated and uh, want to raise awareness regardless if they have had any personal experiences or not. Oh. Okay. Um, yes. So, what do we do? Uh, our goal is to create an environment that supports mental health and we are trying to reach that goal by sharing our personal experiences. Uh, we do believe that our experiences are the most powerful uh, tool we have and we are trying to implement it in almost every activity we do. We give lectures, we have some public discussions and private events and uh, also we have a Facebook group that I think uh, kind of sets us apart from other organizations because it's very special. We use it as our main communication channel and also as a safe space uh, for our members. So a little bit about the uh, lectures. Um, 
We give them with the Estonian Medical Students Association. Usually we have two to three lecturers. Uh, one of them shares uh, a personal experience story. Um, then we have some information about the most common uh, mental health problems, how to get help and how to help yourself. And uh, one of the things we have started to use, one of the tools, is Google Forms, uh, where you, uh, where the audience can uh, send us their questions or comments, um, because mental health is still a very stigmatized topic, and especially for young people, it is very hard to talk about. So we have found that having the option to send your question anonymously uh, works really well, actually. So. And we have uh, used it at our other events as well, not only at the lectures. For example, this is a picture from a public discussion we had about eating disorders, uh, where Elise Grigor, who wrote the book about her experiences uh, with an eating disorder, and me, we, we talked about our experiences. And uh, you can't really see it very well from the picture, but we had a link where you could send your questions and uh, we did get some questions and uh, something that was very heartwarming from uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, from this discussion was that uh, there was a mother in the audience who said that thanks to Elise being so open about her experiences her daughter also sought help for her problems so that was uh, <laughs> very hard warming moment for us. Uh, we use the stories to, to reach uh, our target audience uh, through campaigns as well. We teamed up with uh, PAC uh, for hashtag Superkanglesit, which means superheroes in Estonian. Um, this campaign lasted for one month uh, in April and May. And uh, during this uh, campaign, we uh, posted stories that were sent to us by young people about their experiences with mental health problems. And we posted them on our Facebook page with uh, some quotes to illustrate uh, the posts. And here are some examples. Um, I could translate them as well. So the left one is, my sister had a new teacher who bullied her. Her friends didn't talk to her much either because she did not have much time to go anywhere because she went to music school. Her best friend met up with her after music school and her parents were very supportive. If she didn't have them, she would have killed herself. At least that's what she said. So this one was sent to us by a 13 year old boy about uh, his sister. And uh, the other one uh, was sent by a 17 year old girl. And it says depression should not be a topic that people are afraid to talk about. It should be as normal as any other physical injury. After all, it is important to be happy. Um, they actually reached surprisingly a lot of people and uh, we gained a lot of uh, likes on our Facebook page and we could make ourselves more uh, visible uh, through that campaign. So a little bit more about our Facebook group. Um, it is a closed group. We have 73 members at the moment. Most of them are members of our organization and some of them are our closer partners from uh, um, we do have some rules to ensure the safety of our members. Uh, we do not share the posts outside of the group unless uh, you have a permission. I will be sharing some examples, but I have permissions for them and all the names and uh, faces have been blocked out for safety reasons. Uh, we respect each other and uh, if we share something in the group, uh, a short description must be written. And if it includes some sensitive uh, topics, a trigger warning must be added as well, uh, again, to protect our members. Uh, here are some examples how we use our Facebook group. So here are two polls where we try to uh, find uh, suitable times for events. And we've found that this works quite well uh so a lot of people well not a lot of people but uh people could attend our events 
um, that way more. Uh, here are some posts from the group. On the left, you can see um, a little interesting post about the advances in psychiatry uh, that was shared in the group. And on the right, um, there is a discussion about which uh, tips uh, you have gotten from psychologists or psychiatrists have been the most useful for you. So there was a discussion and people shared uh, what has been useful for them. And this is actually a common theme in our group uh, that people share um, what has helped them. Uh, here's just uh, on the left a meme a member posted about uh, a panic attack. And on the, on the right, there is a post uh, just to remind uh, the members to take care of themselves. Uh, here are some quotes. Uh, by our members. I hope you have time to read them, but I don't have much time to to pause for a, for a long time here. So maybe if you didn't quite read everything, you can uh, catch up later uh, on YouTube. And here's another quote by Elise, who I already mentioned. Uh, she wrote the book about her experiences and uh, now she has become a member of our organization as well and it's actually very cool that her mother is also a member of our organization a supporting member so i, I think it's very uh awesome <laughs> so um i hope you got some ideas and uh, you have a little bit uh, clearer overview of uh, what we do and how we use uh, smart youth work and if you have any future partnership ideas, you can contact me. And there's also a link to our public Facebook page uh, where you could leave a like. Thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this webinar. All right. Thank you, Martha. Very interesting insights there. Now, we need to wrap it up very soon. As I promised, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, and since we only have a few minutes, I've spoken to our experts here. And I, I have a quick summary of that from Katrin uh, Ulf was asking us about some of the possible negatives that can also happen from our adoption of all these technological tools, and particularly when it comes to AI and the algorithms, if they're selecting things, how do we know that they're making the correct selection? And how do we know that this computer, this Google, this whatever that we're using to help us isn't biased? And it's a great question. Uh, because we're, we're programming these AIs to help us out, but like humans, they can have bias as well. And that can be biased against a, a gender, a religious group, sexual orientation, all sorts of stuff. And that will come down to the data that we use to train individual artificial intelligences. If we're adding data that is biased or naturally has human bias, because we all are, then the algorithm can actually turn out biased results. And it's absolutely something we need to be watching out for. Um, it, it, it's a very important thing. We can't just trust that we need to understand something about how it's making these decisions. So certainly a very important word of warning there. And the last one was uh, Gabrielle from Romania. As I said, just a quick few ones. And it, it was a very uh, interesting point about, well, if youth workers need to use uh, phones or devices, which uh, have enough memory and you can load the apps on and have all the things that you may need, um, that's expensive. That costs money. And what do you do in countries that are less well off? And, and I guess in Romania, particularly outside of the cities, you, you no doubt see that. Uh, I would think that it is also a reflection of the greater community. If the young people in your community all have iPhone 7, how did they get iPhone 7? This is not an advantaged community. So I would imagine that your technology that you use just needs to reflect what the young people are using in your particular community. Uh, and that might help you. It, it doesn't have to be great or high, it just has to be level, I think. Now there's still financial challenges there, but we're certainly not saying that everyone needs iPhone 7. to 
make these solutions happen. So I want to talk about how smart youth work. Hope that you've learned more about the Smart Youth Work Initiative here in Estonia. My name is Louis Cesar. I've been the host. Thank you very much for logging on. You can check it all out later. See you later, everybody. Hello, everyone. Before you log off, I would invite you to fill in a little poll. So please rate rate this uh, webinar. Uh, how how you felt today? In case you can see it, I can see myself off air for some reason. So I do not know what is going on.